The following KQED production was produced in high definition. It's striped bass and halibut season in the San Francisco Bay, and the stripers are biting. Sport fishing boats and Bay Area piers are full of people casting for a catch. Uh, today we are fishing about uh, halibut. I'm fishing for sea bass. Usually I fish in a boat out here for halibut, striped bass. Yeah, there's halibut out here. I'll definitely eat halibut. What these anglers at the Berkeley Pier may not know is that their tasty meal might not be as healthy as they think. Some of the fish they're hauling in are loaded with a hefty dose of mercury. Larger fish, those apex predators such as the swordfish, shark, ahi, albacore, sea bass, large halibut, uh, sturgeon, all these large fish live a long time and eat other fish. So mercury will accumulate in the aquatic system, and so the apex predators have the highest mercury levels. This naturally occurring metal when it enters the food chain is toxic and can cause permanent damage to the central nervous system. It's neurotoxic to developing brains. So pregnant nursing mothers, small children, babies, should not consume mercury on a regular basis or at all. Any exposure to mercury is not good, but when you've got concentrations of mercury at the level that they are in San Francisco Bay, it's problematic for both the wildlife that eats the fish out of the bay and also for the people who are consuming those fish. Sejal Choksi is with San Francisco Baykeeper, an environmental group that's been advocating for an aggressive mercury cleanup plan. Mercury is prevalent, it's throughout the whole system, um, but you can't see it. Because of its potency and highly changeable nature, mercury poses unique challenges to monitoring and cleanup efforts. Mercury is really poisonous at low concentrations, and so to measure it accurately, you have to make sure that you don't contaminate the sample. Russ Flegel runs the Microbiology and Environmental Toxicology Program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He and his team of scientists are measuring the pervasiveness of mercury throughout the Bay System. Mercury is a terrific element. It's really interesting because it's so complex. It's the only element that exists as a liquid at room temperature, but it also exists in a gaseous form. Mercury is found primarily in a red rock known as cinnabar. When it settles in waterways, bacteria transform it into a form known as methylmercury. That's the kind that Flegel is most concerned about. Methylmercury is highly toxic and is easily absorbed by tiny aquatic organisms. It can be bioaccumulated, which means at each trophic level in the food chain, the concentration gets higher. And methylmercury then is picked up in plants and is picked up in the um, organisms that eat the plants. And as you move up the food chain to bigger and bigger organisms, you get more and more mercury. In wildlife, mercury in high concentrations can cause developmental problems, just as it does in humans. You can have issues where eggs don't hatch, fetuses don't develop properly, you have birth defects. If you've got mercury impairing wildlife and their immune systems, then they're more susceptible to infectious diseases. They can have cancerous growths. It's the, pretty much the same as in the human population. Few would suspect that this poisonous element is also at the root of California's history and prosperity. In the 19th century, mercury was used extensively in the gold rush, and the best place to find mercury was in the cinnabar-rich hills just south of San Jose in a town called New Almaden. John Slenter is a ranger and park interpreter at Almaden Quicksilver County Park. What is unique of this find was there was no other working mercury mine anywhere in North America. 1848, they discover gold. 49 was the gold rush. 
So now when California needed mercury for the gold mines, here was a locally close by source of mercury. This is a piece of pure cinnabar here, very high grade. Sometimes there were walls that were 30 feet tall and nothing but solid cinnabar deposited in these hills. And like a little bit like gold, this was hitting pay dirt when you found this type of high grade ore in that kind of quantity. To extract mercury, crushed ore was heated in furnaces to about 1200 degrees. The high temperatures transformed the mercury into a vapor. As the gas cooled and condensed, it turned into a liquid form known as quicksilver. They would weigh out 76 pounds of it in a liquid or in a metal container called a flask, and then it was always tagged at 99.9% .9 pure. Mercury is naturally attracted to gold, and Sierra miners put it to work separating the precious metal from crushed rock. By the early 1900s, miners had switched to cyanide to extract gold. But mercury still had many uses in industry, medicine, dentistry, and common household products. In most mining operations are short-lived, the ore runs out, but this was mined from 1845 until 1976. And the riches that took were taken out of these hills. They took out more metallic wealth out of these hills than any gold or silver mine. All that wealth left behind a legacy in the form of mercury mining waste. Rocky deposits from the old furnaces are leaching mercury into the creeks and rivers that are part of the South Bay's Guadalupe watershed. Mercury-tainted sediment can also be found throughout the Sierra Nevada, San Pablo Bay, and the Delta. Their contaminated waters all drain into San Francisco Bay. The problem with mercury is it's not just a historic pollutant. It is the major inorganic environmental pollutant being put into the environment now. Mercury travels through the air, too. It drifts in emissions from local oil refineries and cement kilns. And large quantities also come from coal-burning power plants in China. Coal contains mercury naturally. When you burn that coal, the, all of the mercury goes into the atmosphere. It's carried all the way across the Pacific. And then when it rains in California, it brings that mercury down with it. Mercury is also in wastewater and in stormwater runoff. For most people, they don't really realize how much it is in our day-to-day -day lives. Historically, it's been used even in things such as uh, electric switches and uh, now in fluorescent bulbs. And so it tends to be everywhere, but not visible. Bruce Wolf is with the Regional Water Quality Control Board. It's the state agency that oversees water pollution in the Bay Area. We're concerned about mercury down into the part per billion range, essentially a drop of water in a backyard swimming pool is about a part per billion. And so even a thermometer or what's in a fluorescent bulb is a significant amount. Roughly 2,700 pounds of mercury enter the bay every year from all these different sources. The bay is slowly cleaning itself, washing 3,100 pounds a year out to sea. But because so much has built up over time, it needs a helping hand. To speed up the process, the regional board has launched the largest effort ever to clean up toxic pollution in the Bay. It's targeting mercury hotspots, controlling erosion, and where possible, removing sediment. Trying to dredge the whole Bay of all of the mercury-laden sediment really is infeasible. So we'll look at how we can cap that sediment, how can we keep it in places where it's not going to be a problem. Even with these efforts, getting mercury to safe levels will take at least 70 years because so much has built up in bay mud. At a minimum, three generations will be impacted by this potent and long-lasting poison. But the dangers aren't just confined to people who consume fish from San Francisco Bay. Kevin, let's look at your lab that you just had done. And essentially what I found was that your mercury level in your blood was a little high. Dr. Jane Hightower became an expert in mercury toxicity after identifying mercury poisoning in several of her patients. I had patients with clusters of nonspecific symptoms, fatigue, troubles concentrating and thinking, insomnia, 
uh, muscle and joint aches, stomach upset. And I started one by one going through those patients and asking them what they ate. She learned that several times a week, they were consuming ocean fish at the top of the food chain, like swordfish, shark, and ahi tuna, all extremely high in mercury. My high-risk patient is your more affluent patient that doesn't like bones in their fish, they don't like a fishy flavor, and they're health conscious. So they ate fish for health reasons, only to be poisoned by the mercury because they didn't know about it. If exposure isn't too long-term, mercury will work its way out of the system. Dr. Hightower's patients generally recover in six months to a year. And then we're gonna recheck in a couple months and see how you do. While the prognosis may be good for Dr. Hightower's patients, a return to good health won't come as quickly for the Bay. The cleanup plan is really a long-term roadmap. We're focusing now on where there are areas to clean up, where are there areas we can control the discharge so that as we have new information or new research, new money, uh, we can move forward and hopefully far beat that 70 year time frame. Accelerating the cleanup, which could cost local governments billions, is exactly what some environmental groups are hoping for. The San Francisco Bay should be a resource for the community it's not a place that should be allowed to be contaminated and polluted. So whatever we can do to clean up the contamination in the Bay as fast as possible is what we should be doing.